the phone. So yeah, great. You hear anything now on the live stream? Uh, no. That would be cool. Can you hear anything now on the live stream? Oh, there is like a... Um... And we're going to test this again to see if you can hear through the lunch. Uh, yeah, right. So Nick I will... I think you've all seen me talk. I'm a very goofy kind of person. So actually, yeah, we do have a lab mic and we have a handheld. It, do you want the lab? I do go like this a lot. So. Yeah, the lab is a little sensitive, but we can okay. test it out. If, if the other um, one's easier. Yeah. Well, yeah. perfect. Oh, hello, future Kian. This is Chris from the past. We are currently live, so. <laughs> uh, okay, so this is perfect. Um, so I'm going to. Problem is, can that like move? Yeah, we can turn the thought. So it can't move, so it's, it's okay. even if it's loud over there. With the yeah, so. All right, well, you can give it a try. Hey, can you hear me? I'm talking over here. Oh, there like, you guys. Oh, I, I turned off the, I turned off the podium mic. Oh, so. Hey, can you hear me if I talk over here? Wow. Yeah, You're going for a trip over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like fine. It's not like a stretch at all. Oh, that's how I'm going to talk. That's how I talk normally. <laughs> wait, wait, and the lavalier is off. Here's, here's, yeah, only the podium mic's on. Here's yeah, so, yeah, all right. <laughs> All right, so then maybe we just make a little announcement, turn up. Yeah, you know, that's a good point. We could just, just space. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Should we mute yeah, then? So or? Oh, we're muted now. Just so you guys know, we advertise this to the Frontiers of Science students, which will help with turnout, but they also are very rude and do show up at things late and unapologetic. So I just wanted to warn you. That's fine. I just wanted to warn you about that. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, just showing up later. Okay. No, very good <laughs> audience members. <laughs> uh, so, okay, do you want to just... Well, like, the chance would be he could hear just fine if I was speaking loud through that mic. Okay, so, so we could just keep it simple and go with that. Okay, I'll just keep the podium mic on the lab and handheld off. Yeah, yeah. no, that'd be perfect. Yeah, that's how loud I'm going to talk the whole time, so that'd okay. be perfect. Yeah, and that's perfect. You should yeah. probably do the photo of the second photo. Okay, don't watch it. Oh, oh, it's... On, on hearing. Oh, it's currently muted. So, we're, are you <laughs> yeah. in some I'm, I'm seeing our uh, conversation during second photo. It does clearly say muted. <laughs> it's still coming through very clearly. Uh, maybe. Oh, wait, 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 wait. This is it from here. This is it from here. I I yeah, I mean, it's not muted. So that's okay. Your phone clips, and I was like, you're so nonchalant about dropping that. <laughs> yeah, so is if we connect to the HDMI, we can't share this. So we're just going to connect after this video, and then we're done with this. So actually, let's, let's try that. I no longer hear it. So that's what we tried last week. So it's been I'll do all of this. I'm still hearing this. Oh, because it's not. So this is the meeting. So you're not going to unmute it? No. I'm going to leave it unmuted. Plug in. Did we just wait ten minutes? Yeah, I think that's all we can. to get his screen to show up. Yeah. Um.
Oh, yeah. 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 No, I can. Should I move it over there? I think, or uh, up to you. Okay. Uh, Whatever's easier. Work on each other's stuff. Oh no, it's over here. Uh, 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 I think we can move to here. Yeah. Okay. So we can just go like that. It's good. We want to do it just to make sure it works. Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. Also, do you want the uh, clicker? No, I'll just, I can walk over. It's fine. Oh, if it is, is there a clicker? I mean, is it all connected and everything? Uh, just need to put a view. Oh, no, don't worry about it. I'll just click the arrows. I really don't mind at all. I walk around a lot, so it's... Oh, that's right, because you're just going to click the buttons. I see. You sure you don't have to? No, don't worry about it. It's okay. Well, yeah, you're right. I'm being obstinate about it. Just because if you do decide. Well, to because more does it have a laser pointer? Yeah. That's what I want. I want the laser okay. pointer. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'll use this for the laser pointer. Okay. And you want to actually just put the USB. Gotcha. Wherever. Yeah. Hey, would you look at that? I don't have any yeah, else. Yeah. Converter. Oh. Uh, I put oh, it in there. I think that was a That's funny. I thought the new MacBook did have USB. That is strange. That is completely phased out. And then it should work. Cool. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now I have a whole character just on my presentations for you. And I was going to even say, this is Virginia. She's here. I'm happy. <laughs> it's just because you would argue with it, maybe. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. 
scales here, that ethereal humming. Okay. Testing, testing. I just don't want it to like, feed back into. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to make sure there's no echo. It's good on the. Okay. But I'll be over there doing that one. Just in case. Let's just like have a mic out here. Uh, we can make it next. Um, so, can you? Yeah. Uh, all, all monitors. Oh, that's your. Uh, Oh, Melissa brought a whole litter. Wow, I wish I was as comfy as I could. Oh, like it. <laughs> All right, we're just doing another mic check. <laughs> it's a long All right, yeah, and like I so I'll announce, turn your volume. So. Yeah. Yes, I can definitely do it, yeah. And we could try just like putting this out. I just think I'm a less reliable person to have my hands near my face. So I can, yeah, if, if I can be heard well enough, I can just stand over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So then that'll oh, be I'll perfect. Stand more over here. Yeah. How many people are in line here, Bill? Three? Oh, my. All right, I guess I should go sit like normal, right? Because there's a while for me. Yeah. Okay, cool.
Right. <laughs> uh, uh, hello there. So it's about that time. We'll be getting started soon. Yes, so thank you all for coming out. To, to Pupin on this rainy Friday night. And we're here to welcome you to our public lecture and stargazing lecture series uh, here at Columbia University from the Department of Astronomy. I'm your MC, I'm Chris Carr. I'm a graduate student uh, here at Columbia and I'll be sort of leading the festivities here today. And, and we have a whole program prepared for you today. In a, in a few moments, we'll get started with the astronomy trivia and so give you an opportunity to sort of flex your astronomy knowledge. Uh, and then after that, we will have our main event, which is the public lecture by Dr. Nick Luber on the habitat of jellyfish galaxies. And then afterwards, we'll finish up with a Q&A where you'll have a chance to ask, ask uh, Dr. Luber questions to you in the auditorium. Um, and also uh, questions afterwards after we're, after the talk, and also through uh, through our, our sign up form over here, and so the center uh, the center one will allow you to ask questions of of Dr. Luber if you don't want to raise your hand. Um, uh, and also for those of you who who came in late, uh, we have the the sign up form, uh, which is the URL there, which will allow us to keep attendance to keep a, a track record of of how how many from the public are are attending these events. Um, yeah, and also, so the the reception that we'll, we'll have later on will be if if you were here last time, you know, we will have our reception on the fifth floor where there will be uh, hot chocolate and the opportunity to continue the conversation with our speaker and the various astronomers who are hidden among you. Yeah, so with that, I guess we <laughs> we can move forward to yeah. There are there are look to your left, look to your right. One of you could be an astronomer. Uh, in disguise. So with that, I'll turn it over to Selena, who will lead us through astronomy trivia. Hello. Um, if you remember me, I am here and I am doing the trivia. And I just want to echo Chris is saying that your support to us is astronomical. I literally just thought of that and I want to use that. <laughs> All right, so how this works is that I will guide us through a series of questions and the um, choices that are associated with them. And if you think that that choice is the best choice to answer the question, you raise your hand and we do a little community vote thing. Does that sound good? Okay. All right, question one. Most galaxies in the universe are gravitationally... Oh, that is blocked. <laughs> yeah, sorry, one second. 
Thank you so much. <laughs> Most galaxies in the universe are gravitationally clumped together into a larger structure called galaxy groups and galaxy cl clusters. For instance, our galaxy, the Milky Way, resides in a local group, which in turn resides in the Laniakia supercluster. Approximately how many galaxies are in, are in the Laniakia supercluster? All right, we vote 100. Raise your hand if you think it's a hundred um, galaxies in a supercluster. Oh, no one, a thousand. All right, some some people. 10,000? Ooh, way more of us. And a hundred thousand, that's a lot of galaxies. Ooh, okay. Well, what happens to people who didn't vote? <laughs> you think that they're bigger or smaller? Yell it out. I know you didn't vote. I can see it. Okay, either way. You will be correct if you are part of the part uh trace D. It's a hundred thousand uh galaxies in the supercluster. So we are one among the a hundred thousand. All right. Question two. The space between galaxies in a galactic cluster, galaxy cluster, is filled with hot gas called the intracluster medium or ICM. In a typical cluster. Roughly what, what fraction of the cluster's total mass is in the galaxies and what fraction is in the ICM? Trace A, 15% galaxies, 85% ICM. All right, some, some, some of us. B, 85% galaxies and 15% ICM. Okay, also some of us. C, 50% galaxies and 50% ICM. D, 5% galaxies and 15% ICM. Ooh, this one doesn't even add up to 100. Wink, wink. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, Locking answers, three, two, one, we go. Ha, did that trick you? It turns out the, uh, the other 80% of the stuff is dark matter. So that's why it doesn't really add up to 100 on the um slides. And wink, wink. All right, question three. As a galaxy evolves, its shape changes due to a variety of internal and external influences. One such channel of galaxy evolution is that of the galactic mergers, through which multiple disc-shaped spiral galaxies can combine to form a puffy, round elliptical galaxy. In roughly how many years will our very own spiral galaxy start to merge with the nearby spiral galaxy Andromeda? A, 4.5 trillion years. All right, one of us. B, 1 trillion years. A few more of us. C, 4.5 billion years. That's roughly the age of our sun, I think. Um, D, 1 billion years. All right, wait, what happened to the people who didn't vote? Come on, let's do it again. For context, the universe is around 14 billion years. A, B, C. Hey, we got one more. D? Okay, a few. Three, two, one, C. So um, in 4.5 billion years, our galaxy will merge with Andromeda. All right, let's see some pretty pictures now. Question four. Which of the following galaxy will you be most likely to find at the center of a galaxy cluster? A, some spirally thing. B, some other spirally thing, but like spiral, less spiral. C, a glob. And D, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> All right, um, locking your answers. It turns out it's C. So A is called M81. It's a grand design spiral galaxy. You can see that it's spirally. B is the NGC. Uh, 1300, it's a bar spiral galaxy. So it's still spiral, but it has a bar in the middle. C is M87. It's a elliptical galaxy. And D is IC4710, which is an irregular galaxy. And that's why we can't really put a shape to it. All right, last question of the trivia. Jellyfish galaxies, which is the topic hour tonight. Jellyfish galaxies are special galaxies that only seem to exist in regions with lots of gas, like the interior of galaxy clusters. Which of the following photos show a jellyfish galaxy? 
A. Some galaxy with them, some like um tails. B. Some puffy that looks like a hen. Um. C. Some infinity sign going on in the universe. Okay. And D. Some globally thing that are trying to touch at one point. Come on, come on, vote again. Let's go. A. B. C. D. It turns out that it is one, A. Um, if you notice on the poster that's handed out, it's this one, but it's extremely hidden in the background. And it's not that obvious. Um, so A is a jellyfish galaxy. B is called the Pillars of Creation, which is a nebula where stars can form. C is a, a pairing of merging galaxies. So that's what we like see two questions ago. And D is Hercules A, which is a radial galaxy. I hope that you had a lot of fun um, with the Astro Trivia, and I'm sure that Dr. Nick Luber's presentation will be out of this world. I also just thought of that and wanted to use that. Uh, let me move back to Chris uh, to talk more through logistics and introduce the speaker. Thank you, Selena, for another great round of trivia. And for those of you who are just entering in, please, use the sign up form here or use the QR code up there and the URL over there just to just for us to keep a record of how many people from the public are attending these lectures. It, it means a lot, um, especially once we get these statistics and and allows us to, and it gives us actual stats. You know, we can go to the department and say, hey, people are actually coming to this. Please give us more money. So uh, this is so your your attendance here is 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 worth a lot. Great. So now moving forward to our our main event. We have, oh, no, oh, of course, wait, before, before we move on to, to the talk, we have a TikTok now. And that's the page here. And we have, we posted our first video earlier this week. It's kind of like a, a astronomy, but the office. It's, it's very, very wonderful. Uh, so please, here's our TikTok. If you have a TikTok, please, I'm sorry, but please follow us here on, on uh, we have we have ten followers, so you could be the eleventh follower. It's it's a lot of fun, and we will be posting more videos at some point. So please, so we already have almost a thousand people have watched this video. You could be there as well. So important information I had to get out there first before moving to our talk with Dr. Nick Luber. So before Nick uh, comes to, to the podium for, for his talk, uh, Dr. Nick Luber started his academic journey as an undergraduate at Columbia University, where after attending a required first year lecture on cosmology, he promptly changed his area of study to astrophysics and began to study galaxy evolution using techniques of radio interferometry. He continued his studies at West Virginia University, where he earned his PhD in astrophysics and then moved on to his current position as a Columbia University Frontiers of Science Fellow. When he is not thinking about space, Dr. Luber enjoys niche documentaries, concocting exquisite red sauce, and listening to muty music. So please welcome to the stage Dr. Nick Luber. I think my bio sounds a little better when you say it with my like slight air of sarcasm after every <laughs> sentence. But I guess Chris just get inside. Sorry, I have to stay over there, so I have to bring my spot over here. All right. Hello, everybody. That's pretty good. All right, that bodes well for this talk. All right, so I'm Dr. Nick Luber. I'm gonna tell you all about jellyfish galaxies. Uh, I want, uh, maybe even require of this talk that nobody falls asleep. No, it's a low bar, but at my uh, dissertation defense, not one, but two of my family members fell asleep. So. We're going to try to keep things a little bit lively, 
And to do that, we're going to have some audience participation. So when I ask questions, I want you to answer. And if you answer, you will be rewarded. So let's take an example. I'm going to pick on you because I know you. What's your name? All right, Brandon, here's a candy. So you get a candy for participating. The candies are somewhat space themed, Starbucks. And unfortunately, Morgan Williams doesn't have any other space themed candies. So the other one is Snickers, which are equally loved. So, all right, so let's get into it. This talk. First necessitates understanding what is a jellyfish galaxy, which is not immediately obvious, right? Where do jellyfish live? The ocean, excellent. They don't live in space. What an absurd premise. So we need to define what a jellyfish galaxy is. How can we do that? What should we look at first? The shape of what? Oh, that's very good. Too technical though, I want even simpler. We're gonna look at other galaxies, right? If it's a jellyfish galaxy, then probably there's other galaxies that don't look like jellyfish. So here we have a beautiful image of galaxy. All right, we're all gonna go on three. One, two, three. Ah. It's extraordinary. All of these are galaxies. Okay, so now tell me, what are some things that are different about these galaxies? What do we notice about their features? Wow, way up there. I love the enthusiasm. They're different colors. All right. Oh, oh teamwork, teamwork. Yeah, there we go. I my shirt a little bit there. <laughs> That's all right. It was worth it for the good throw. So they're different colors, which definitely tells us something about a galaxy. What else is different about them? It's different shapes. Also very true. What else? Uh, different size. These are great options. So different colors, shapes, and size. Yeah, that's enough. Uh, and those all have to do with both where they are in the universe and what the galaxies are actually made of or what's going on within them. So again, before we get to the jellyfish galaxies, let's talk a little bit about what normal galaxies are. Normal galaxies can broadly be put into two different categories, spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies. Spiral galaxies are, as the name might suggest, generally characterized by having spiral arms. They also generally are blue in color, are actively forming stars, and have a significant amount of their mass locked up in gas. As a fun piece of trivia, <laughs> what object in everyday life which perhaps for some younger folks, this might not be in their everyday life, uh, would have the same aspect ratio, so the same diameter to width ratio as a spiral galaxy. No, but I'm still going to give you a candy. <laughs> Instead of a vinyl record, a little more in the future, a CD. They're a little small. So a CD has about the same ratio. So they are, in fact, quite thin, which is Maybe not. Tough crowd. And then on the other side, there's elliptical galaxies. And in almost every way, they're the opposite. Instead of a disk, they have much more defined three axes. So they look, they can range anywhere from a sphere to an American football. Uh, they are yellow or red in appearance. They have very little gas. Asterisks. Some people would say that they do have some gas, but it is still quite small, so we won't entertain their arguments. Oh, 
right. Uh, and they are not really forming stars, and they have none of those sort of beautiful spiral features that we see in spiral galaxies, or any sort of beautiful features. So in general, they're kind of just like those big masses of light. Now, this isn't the story for all galaxies. Of course, these are just the normal ones. We also have a sampling of peculiar galaxies. So this talk is going to focus on jellyfish galaxies. But just for completeness's sake, we're going to talk about, I'm just going to introduce the other uh, types of peculiar galaxies to give you an appreciation of how niche of a question this is. It's not as if the universe is just like every other galaxy is jellyfish galaxies. This is a very specific question in trying to understand where they came from. Because there's all sorts of weird things in the universe. There's jellyfish galaxies. There's merging galaxies, uh, such as this, which is uh, the penguin. See the little penguin? And he's guarding the egg. <laughs> but uh, what's really cool is the egg is an elliptical galaxy and it's tearing apart the penguin. <laughs> Tell me a darker story in there somewhere. Uh, so that's cool. There's a galaxy like this one, where you have an elliptical sort of looking light mass, but then also a disk to dust lane in it. What's going on there? Subject for a different talk. And then we have also shell galaxies, for example, here, where you see these beautiful layers of starlight and these well-defined sort of circles around the galaxy. All of these are things we observe in the universe in multitudes. But, as I said, Kind of the title of this talk will suggest, we're going to focus just on jellyfish galaxies. So, just now, to describe exactly what we mean by jellyfish galaxies, we'll just get that out of the way. On the sort of level zero, you can think of them as a subset of spiral galaxies. The main body of a jellyfish, sort of the floofy part, you picture a jellyfish in the ocean. I thought you guys would like that demo. <laughs> the floofy part is a sort of normal spiral galaxy. Okay. Uh, so that means it has all the other traits of a spiral galaxy. It's blue, it has spiral arms, it's star forming, and there's gas. All of that holds for jellyfish galaxies. Now, the part that makes them jellyfish are these excellent tail features. Yeah, it, it's not a great contact on the screen, but you see these sort of red tendril-like tails emanate from these galaxies in all cases. And that's sort of their defining characteristic of jellyfish galaxies, is they have a spiral galaxy with tails coming out of them. And these tails can be made out of uh, regular old neutral hydrogen gas, gas that has been ionized, they can have stars in them. They can have molecular gas in them. And more than all of those, is there a combination of all of those, really? Uh, they also, as a point of fact about the jellyfish galaxies, exist in clusters. This asterisk is here is because perhaps they exist in other sort of mediums and look different. But for now, we're going to focus on cluster uh, jellyfish galaxies. Okay. There we go, okay. So now to the uh, question of this topic. What is the habitat of jellyfish galaxies? So I mentioned, it's clusters, it's galaxy clusters. Okay, that's great. But what is that exactly? Are some words that perhaps mean nothing. But they do in fact mean so galaxy clusters are the largest gravitationally bound structures in the universe. What that means is you have a galaxy. So think of our own Milky Way galaxy, right? There's hundreds of billions of stars that are gravitationally bound, spinning around some common center. And it's somewhat shocking when you think that that's not, in fact, the largest gravitationally bound structure in the universe. There's even bigger things that are spinning around. So in the case of galaxy clusters, they're not exactly spinning. They have more chaotic motion. But they're still stuck together. 
they're still stuck together. They're not flying apart. And that's really what gravitationally bound is. They're not flying apart. And these galaxy clusters can consist of at least hundreds, and in some, in many cases, thousands of galaxies that are stuck together, moving chaotically around. All of those galaxies, hundreds of billions of stars. So they really are these quite impressively large structures. And within them, they have all of the galaxies that we've seen so far. They have normal spiral galaxies, which generally lie on the outskirts of clusters. They have elliptical galaxies, which you generally see in the center region of those clusters. They have merging galaxies that you can find throughout. They can have transitional galaxies that you can find throughout. And they can have, last but not least, jellyfish galaxies. Good job, class. And these jellyfish galaxies are, of course, with the toxons, so we'll localize them a little bit more. But the other thing that these galaxy clusters have is this sort of center. So this is a, a very cool image made by a Columbia professor and a Columbia graduate student some years ago, where all of the green and blue are galaxies on the outskirts of a cluster. But this center here is not a galaxy. The center of that image is very hot ionized gas in the center of the galaxy cluster. And all galaxy clusters have this. They have cores of very hot gas. We saw in the trivia questions, this is called the ICM, the intracluster medium. There's a lot of gas, and it's quite spread out, but it is always there in the center of galaxy, at galaxy clusters. So if that's where jellyfish galaxies are, where exactly in the clusters are they? Are they dispersed all throughout, or do they have some sort of more localized region? And it turns out they have a more localized region. So this uh, diagram here um, is a little tricky to think about, but we can do it. On the x-axis here, the horizontal axis, we have the distance from the center of the cluster. So this has kind of funny units, because we're looking at a whole bunch of different clusters just on one graph. So you just kind of have to normalize it by how big the clusters are. But it's the same idea, it's the distance from the center. The further to the right you are, the further you are. On this plot, the jellyfish galaxies are the red X's, where, in respect, to the x-axis, do they all lie? Close to the center, right? They're all within 0 0.5, it would be 20 units, of the galaxy clusters. They're all very near the center. What about the y-axis? Oh, well, let me explain the y-axis first. The y-axis is the velocity. So I mentioned that in these galaxy clusters, the galaxies are moving all around each other very quickly um, and, and somewhat chaotically, too. And these velocities can have different effects on them. So where do we sort of see these jellyfish galaxies in the velocity curve? Yeah, they are somewhat all throughout. Uh, if you were to sort of look at even more jellyfish galaxies than this, because this is just a sample of five, you would find that they tend to preferentially be at higher velocities, which is not obvious from this diagram because it's only a sample of five. Um, so generally, they can occupy a lot of different velocities, but tend more towards high velocities. So they're at the center of these clusters and moving at all kinds of different velocities. So that's where they live. That is the habitat of the jellyfish galaxies. So. The question then that we want to answer, we've established what a jellyfish galaxy is with respect to other galaxies. We now know where they live. But if you think about how the talk started, it, was, it started by differentiating them from normal galaxies. At this point, we should ask, well, how do they end up looking funny like this? Right? And then you might think, well, they only live in one sort of area it might have something to do with their habitat, which is not a bad guess. 
so how I wanted to answer this question is by using radio telescopes. Radio telescopes are these big, sort of, they look like satellite dishes, right? You put on your house, you get satellite TV. They look like that, but much bigger. Here we have a telescope that's uh, 25 meters, and it's part of a larger group of telescopes. There's 27 of these 25 meter telescopes that observe radio waves. Uh, <laughs> and which we observe radio waves to try to tell us more about these galaxies. And it turns out that what radio waves can tell us about them is a couple things. But what I'm going to focus on is they can tell us about the amount of gas in these galaxies. So we specifically study the amount of neutral gas. Because neutral gas is sort of the raw fuel for star formation uh, in a galaxy. You have all these neutral hydrogen particles flying around. They get colder, they get colder. They come closer, they come closer. Eventually, nuclear fusion starts. Boom, and you get a star. So if you have more neutral hydrogen, you can have more stars being formed, sort of loosely speaking. So generally, galaxies in the outskirts of clusters have more of this neutral hydrogen. And galaxies in the center of clusters have very little. And this is because of a process called Gram pressure stripping. And this is sounds like a fancy sort of physics term. But it's really not. Gram pressure. Okay? Astronomers are not an imaginary bunch. Because the galaxies are literally just ramming in the other gas. And it causes pressure. That's it. So these galaxies ram in that gas in the center of clusters, and that pushes the gas out. And once the gas is pushed out of them, they no longer have any more gas to form stars. So that's super cool. Why, if jelly, so using this sort of everything we've learned so far about ram pressure, about where we've learned the jellyfish galaxies live. Do you think the jellyfish galaxies have a lot of gas, more than we think they should, or a regular amount, or very little? Very little? I, I'll give you a snicker since you're so. You gotta catch the snicker. Oh, that was a beautiful throw. Like a beautiful catch. <laughs> Oh wait, I forget that you said I got two gross to catch. What'd you say? Very little? Yeah. No, that's not my turn, but it's still worth the <laughs> Not very little. What do we think? What? Nope. <laughs> what else? Very little? No. Aha, <laughs> So, they don't have very little, they don't have a lot. And they don't have a regular amount. They kind of have the amount in between very little and regular. <laughs> Which you obviously were supposed to know. I don't know about this audience. And this is summed up beautifully in this plot. So let's unpack this plot here. We have on the x-axis here, we have the mass of galaxies within the stars. So how much the stars in the galaxies weigh. And on the y-axis here, we have the amount of gas in the galaxies. The gray region is the normal amount of gas for a given stellar mass. So if you weigh this much in stars, you should weigh this much in gas. Okay. The blue shaded region is how much Gas, again, with respect to the mass and stars, are in galaxies that have had most of their gas removed. So these are the sort of sad, dead galaxies. Here, these letters are sort of a control sample of galaxies in clusters. And these red markers here are the jellyfish galaxies. So what do we notice about where these red markers are in the plot? Good. 
They're very high in stellar mass, which is 100% true. And also, are they closer to the blue line or the gray line? They're in the middle. Excellent. Which is the answer from that last question. Do they have the right amount or too little? Well, the gray line would be the right amount. The blue line would be too little. On average, they're kind of in the middle. Which is super neat. So they're not regular galaxies. And they're not galaxies that are completely removed of their gas. They are preferentially occupying one space of this sort of possible range of values. So with everything then that we've learned, do you think we could make a physical explanation about the formation of jellyfish galaxies? There's a yes or no question. <laughs> exactly, yes, because if not, what would the punchline of my talk be? So using everything that we've learned, we can devise a physical scenario for these jellyfish galaxies. Wait, what's going on? Oh, see, I don't see it on my laptop. That's annoying. Okay. So, yes, if you take all of this together, you can picture, if you get these beautiful jellyfish galaxies, when you have galaxies that are towards the center of galaxy clusters, okay? So we have galaxies where we know where they are. And then as was pointed out, they're the very massive galaxies, a lot of stars. So that means it's harder to push things out of them. So we know where they are. We know that it's harder to push things out of them. And because of that, their gas doesn't get kicked out right away. It takes longer for the gas to be removed from them. And you get these beautiful tails of removed gas and star formation. All of it from these ingredients that we learned in this talk. So the habitat of these galaxies directly influences how it is that they come to exist in the first place. So, there we go. I just told you how to build a jellyfish galaxy. Pretty easy when you put it like that. Have we answered then all of the questions about jellyfish galaxies? No! We need to say that more confidently. No. Great, because if it was, Several people in this audience would not have a PhD project. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we haven't answered all these questions. So speaking very specifically to just jellyfish galaxies and clusters, I just told you how to build a jellyfish galaxy. But I did not tell you, what is the role of supermassive black holes in these galaxies, if any? What is the role of magnetic fields in the cooling of the, ga of the gas in the tail? What is the... Uh, potentiality of unspiraling the spiral arms in creating the sort of structure that we see. This doesn't address any of those. And in fact, when this paper, uh, that those two plots that I showed sort of built a jellyfish galaxy, they came from the paper that I wrote, they came out last March. Since that, the collaboration that I wrote that paper with, literally the same collaboration, not even a different the same collaboration has written 12 more papers on jellyfish galaxies. Which is super cool to highlight, because I think that I told you a pretty compelling story, perhaps you'll go home and think otherwise, but there's still so much more to be known about them to understand the actual astrophysics happening between them, which is super cool. And how those will be answered is through two different routes, which is always important to highlight. So here we have uh, dishes from a radio telescope, which will be more sensitive and be able to see even deeper images of the gas around these jellyfish, because maybe there's something even crazier going on that we just haven't seen. And perhaps we'll let the second picture uh, is computing power. So these simulations that will be able to tell us about the actual intricacies of the astrophysics happening in the jellyfish galaxies themselves. So there's still so much to learn about them. We might have this qualitative picture that we can tell you about how they may be formed, but all of the cool things, what is the, who, who was that quote, God is in the details? I don't know, somebody probably pretty smart said that something. So very much the case. There's so much still to be learned in these small little details. 
And I think that is my last slide. So thank you all, and I'd love to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Luber, for a great talk. And now we have have time for questions from people in the audience. But also, if you don't want to ask your question out loud, you can submit your, your questions at the second link there, the question dash DEC1. You can follow that link there, and I can read your questions off for you. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the closest, uh, yeah, the question is, what was the sort of closest jellyfish galaxy that we can see? And in terms of galaxy clusters, the closest one lies within the closest galaxy cluster to us, which is the Virgo cluster, which is 18, well, I don't know, 0.1 megaparsecs away, which is something like uh, 50 million light years. So in astronomical terms, it's pretty close. In real life terms, it's less close. Yeah, so that that's a really good question. So first is sort of what I was saying is that the fact that they're on that more massive spectrum. Oh, sorry, I have to read this question. Why aren't these jellyfish galaxies having their gas removed from them right away? What makes them different? So one is what I pointed out more explicitly is their higher mass. And what I was saying about ram pressure is the actual equation of ram pressure linearly depends on the mass of the galaxy. So the more massive you are, the more you can hold on to your gas. What's also most likely true about these uh, jellyfish galaxies is that they're on their first fall through the gas. Exactly. Exactly. Because galaxy clusters take a long time to build up. And the universe is only so old. And uh, just as a sense of scale, to go across a galaxy cluster takes about a billion years. So it just hasn't had time to go back. Is this working? Okay. Um, so this is the and they're moving more. Oh, that's an excellent question. They tend to be younger. Um, <laughs> what is the age of a galaxy? So, right, galaxies are comprised of so many different parts, which all have different ages. So the fact that jellyfish galaxies are so massive means that they were probably built by a whole bunch of mergers of other galaxies. So in that way, they're comprised of a lot of older things, but at their current mass, they haven't been at that mass long. So in that sense, yes, they're, they're sort of younger objects. Okay, at first, I think we'll take a question from the online universe first. And so first, we have a question about the, the letters you showed on your velocity versus distance graph. So more precisely, what do the letters on the y-axis on that slide, what do they indicate? So the letters on that plot, so th that was part of a larger study that I did about uh, galaxy clusters. The letters corresponded to just other galaxies in galaxy clusters. And if you looked at where the letters were, they looked to be more or less normal, which is exactly what we expected. And what was interesting to see is that the letters and the jellyfish galaxies were in different places. So those letters, again, just were directly detected galaxies within galaxies. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Do you think uh, So we're not assuming a vacuum orbit. It's probably a radio orbit to the transmission center. And you shouldn't be able to detect things coming back 
because they should have at that point already have lost all of the bad. So it should be no delicate balance on this question. Is there a very large range of sizes or masses that jellyfish galaxies can have, or do they usually tend to be around the same? That's a good question. So for the work that I've shown, there's not a large range. It, it, it's about an order of 10 grams. So that has to be somewhat with their environment. So perhaps if you see the galaxy going through a different uh, a, a, a less intense, you see that the same thing as jellyfish phenomenon Okay, I think we'll take another question from the online world. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll be merging these two questions together since they're similar. So wh what can what can jellyfish galaxies potentially tell us and why are jellyfish galaxies important to understand? So as an astronomer, they're important to understand because that's a pilot topic. The principal objective of astronomy is to look at the sky and to understand why things look like that. It's a noble idea. It's not uh, But second is to understand the actual physics. Is if we can understand how these jellyfish galaxies get these strange features, we can better understand the environments they live in. And then we uh, our sort of understanding of the evolution of the large dark crust of the universe is most galaxies will end up being in galaxy clusters. It's important to understand how the cluster environment affects galaxy evolution. Uh, I think also this is a quick one from online. Uh, when were jellyfish galaxies first discovered? Uh, so I, I don't know the exact date. I believe it was sometime either in the late 80s or the early 90s in UV. And in H1, not until the late 2000s, Moss. Hmm. Uh, with the mic. I'm asking on behalf of my daughter. She'd like to know why you study jellyfish galaxies above all else. Why do you study jellyfish galaxies above all else? Well, that's a very important question. But also, genuinely, because I think that they're very interesting. Personally, I love the ocean. I love the sail. I love the swim. So on a namesake, I think they're so interesting. And I just think they're one of the most beautiful objects in the sky that are not easy, easily describable. Why do they look like that? And that's really what drew me. Yes. Yeah, so the, I have a okay, I will just say that first. So the density is of order like one atom per uh, cubic centimeter. There's some range, of course, you know, based off of it. The temperature is, is millions of Kelvin. So it's a very hot, diffuse gas. So that's such a low density Uh, this is such a great physics question. I feel like I'm at my defense. Uh, it has to do with the sort of kinetic energy of the particles itself. So, right, they're hot, they're moving around freely, they have all this energy. That's sort of where we get this idea of temperature. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Oh, well, okay. We'll close it out. Yeah, that's a great question. So they don't, there's no reason that they have to be, but sort of the ones that are perpendicular, if you think about how the sky looks, they're the easiest to see. So the first jellyfish galaxies we've identified are ones where they're perpendicular. But like, in all likelihood, there's ones that point in every direction if they're this part of the sea. So it's really, that's really just an observational bias. All right, so let's call it. Uh, Wait, call. One, one last oh. online question. Uh, can I have a candy? <laughs> I guess come and get it. Okay, yeah. good. All right, so everyone get hot chocolate. Well, Chris will probably say more, but on your way out, get candy too. Okay. I only want these starbursts. Yes, Is one last hand for Dr. Luber. <laughs> Just a reminder before you head out, if you have an opportunity, please fill out the feedback form. If you learn something new, 
is there anything, any advice, any questions, any later comments, please fill out the form. And also, hot chocolate on the fifth floor. I'm Chris Carr. That's Dr. Nick Luber. And thank you for coming. One more slide. We'll be, and also, we'll be back February 2nd for our next lecture beginning in the new year. So I guess I have to get hot chocolate. Yeah, sure. Did I throw you a carrot? Um, I think it's because I'm crippled. Yeah. <laughs> but here. This is a little bit random, but I was wondering if you're in a galaxy within like a cluster, how visible 